Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Paul here, realestatepodcastshow.com. Today, I've decided to load up the podcast bus full of gas, and I've decided to take it from Toronto all the way to Texas. And uh, I am so happy to do that, although I had some people complaining on the highway that I was blasting the Dallas TV show theme too loud. And I told them just to keep driving. Don't look, don't look to the side. Just keep driving straight ahead. Uh, so thankfully today, I've got a really interesting guest. I think someone that uh, you guys are going to really enjoy hearing from because in the world of real estate on Twitter, which is hashtag retweet, you only get to really see what people are typing. You don't always get to hear their voice. So today I'm very happy to have a guest uh, that's going to give you some insight on what he does and um, uh, really sort of bring it to life. So again, I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Is it David Auerbach? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So David, uh, and I'm just going to go with David or Dave, whatever you want. Um, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Paul, thanks for joining me. And thanks for uh, making the trip down from Toronto uh, virtually, virtually or not virtually to do this. Whatever, I appreciate it. Virtually. <laughs> Uh, I'm saving I'm saving the environment by doing it virtually, but the podcast bus does exist. It's my it's my minivan that I drive my kids around. I call it the podcast bus. It embarrasses them. Uh, and that's part of the job of being a dad. You got to, you know, humble your kids a little bit. So uh, the, the minivan slash podcast bus, whatever I want to feel like calling it is uh, is what got me where I am. And of course, um, today we're going to be talking about, uh, of course, you know, everything to do with, again, you and what you do. So let's start with a little bit of a quick introduction from you, David. Uh, well, again, thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Dave Auerbach. I am a 25-year uh, uh, Wall Street veteran <clears throat> focused on real estate investment trusts, also known as REITs. Uh, I am the managing director of an ETF issuer here in North America called Armada ETF Advisors. We are the sub-advisor <clears throat> to the residential REIT income ETF. The ticker of that is House, H-A-U-S. Uh, it's basically focused on pure play residential REITs, and we'll dive into it. Okay. If I'm not sitting here educating folks on Twitter, LinkedIn, various social media channels about the REIT industry, chances are you'll either find me at a fish concert uh, around the country, or uh, I will be at my summer camp in northern Wisconsin, uh, that I've been going to since 1987, as well as one other fun fact, my wife and I are failed foster parents, and we are uh, parents to uh, several cats. Those are our kids, and so oh, they keep us busy uh, a lot of the that. time. I love, I love hearing that, man. We just, we just, um, we just adopted another cat. It was a rescue cat. Uh, recently, we called him Little Bear because he's got uh, he's this little tiny cat with these big, huge paws. Um, so I love that you've got, uh, again, obviously the, uh, you know, the furry kids, um, that's, uh, that's, that's, you know, th those, those are important, uh, you know, you guys are important people as well to be, to be doing that. So, uh, Thank again, you. I love, I love that we're sort of, again, we're going to sort of, you know, not deep dive or any of that, uh, trendy, trendy, uh, lingo stuff on, on any one thing. We're just sort of going to go over things. Um, so tell me, let's, let's start off with, um, again, the, the REITs, how, how did you, um, get into that? Were you, were you at all involved in real estate before, uh, in terms uh, of, so, yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I had always wanted to be on wall street when I was a child. And I mean, like five, six years old, my father was a CPA. Uh, we used to get the, used to get the wall street journal and I remember being fascinated back when they would publish stock tables in the newspaper, because back in the day when the Wall Street Journal, it was just columns and columns of, you know, tickers. I remember, and, I remember, and I remember and, being fascinated by that. I don't even know why, but I used to look at them and just try to uh, figure out what the hell is all that saying. It was like you'd go into a hypnotic trance just because all the numbers would blend together. Yes. But I remember yes. what, what fascinated me by it was, you know, my father would be like, look, here's the Boston Celtics. You could buy shares in the Boston Celtics. Here's Walt Disney. And I remember as I was looking at it, one number was like a lot bigger than the others, like just jumped out and it wound up being Berkshire Hathaway. And I was so fascinated looking at Berkshire Hathaway stock price compared to every other number that was on the table that I just, you know, didn't understand. And I'd always, you know, grew up fascinated 
you know, with Wall Street. And my parents love telling the story of, you know, how kids will sit there and watch cartoons before they go off to school every day. I was sitting there watching CNN Money, uh, you know, uh, watching them on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange back when they used to do hand signals and everything, where I was just so fascinated by the crowd that I knew at a young age I was going to go on Wall Street. I, I eventually saw myself being one of those guys that would be on New York, on the floor, doing the stuff that you would see, uh, you know, from the stockbrokers. But that never wound up happening. And so I wound up being an advisor here in Dallas, starting out when I graduated from college. And um, one day, to fast forward a little bit, I got my licenses, I'm getting up and running, you know, great, going to go conquer the world. I get a meeting with the prospect. And I said to my boss, hey, this prospect wants to have lunch with me, you know, can I go to lunch? And my boss is like, no, you can't. And I'm like, why? What? And he's like, he's like, you're mine during market hours. If you want to network and prospect, that's on your time, not on my time. I'm not going to pay you to network and prospect. Yeah. And I'm like, that makes no sense. Like, <laughs> your, my book is your book. You want me to bring in clients. Who am I to tell somebody, sorry, I can't visit with you for lunch. We'll have to do it another time. And, and he was sorry, basically. And, and how exactly does a sale happen? And, and and has it ever happened of, of any of any substance? Has it ever happened again from a purely a phone call? I know it can, but again, the fact is the guy was holding you back from literally communicating with humans. <laughs> Especially being a 22 year old, you know, 23 year old kid who's trying to get their foot in the door, you know, to grow a book of business. Exactly. We were taught in college, networking is a 24 seven gig. There is no set time for you to go and network. It's always happening. Oh, wow. And, you know, so for true. me as a so for me as a trader, if a client called when I was a trader, if a client called me at 3 a.m. because they wanted to put an order in, you know, my clients knew that they could reach out to me any hour of the day. Obviously, yeah. I hated that phone call, <laughs> but they knew that they could reach out to me because again, that's networking. It's building a relationship. It's this guy gets things done. I'm gonna call this guy. And so I remember saying to my boss, like, I go, that's that's crazy. I don't understand. It's the silliest thing I've ever heard. And he's like, my shop, my rules. Yeah. And I and I said to him, you know what? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well, did you say PS, those words? Did I you say those words? Word. Guess what? I got fired the next day because <laughs> I said that. I've been there, man. I've been there. I know what that feels like. It feels good. Look, not at looking, the time. Not at looking the time, back on it. Good. Looking back on it. You know, no regrets, no regrets, no regrets whatsoever. I still think to this day it, it was one of the stupidest things that I've ever heard in my entire life. All right. So, you you know, a couple of things. I, I, I get the newspaper. If you were, yeah. you and I were briefly talking about how we were subscribed to the newspaper. We're, we're, we're old men that read newspapers. I yell at the newspaper. I don't know about you, but I yell at it. <laughs> I'm Italian, so I yell at the TV, too. Uh, so it's just part of my, my, my culture. Yep. Love it. Yeah. Well, back in the day, the paper used to republish, you know, classified ads, job section. Like now it's only on Sundays. You get like a two page thing in the newspaper for jobs. But back in the day, there would be a job section every single day in the newspaper. And I remember responding to an ad. It was about I'm not exaggerating, you know, two point font, two lines. Do you have your series seven and 63? Call this number. That was all that it said in the ad. I had no idea. Um, but call the number, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm unemployed. I was literally, it was like within the first week of being unemployed. I'm unemployed. I'm, uh, you know, uh, looking for opportunities. I'm concerned that again, I'm, I have no book of business. I've just gotten my licenses. What advisor wants to hire me? Mm-hmm. You know, this is going to be an uphill climb. And so I call the number, uh, get invited to come for an interview, and I walk in, and it wound up being an institutional trading desk focused on real estate investment trusts, REITs. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know the first thing about REITs. I mean, when we were in class or in finance class, they would spend about, you know, five minutes of a class talking about REITs or real estate. Um, And I had no idea. And I sat there and I answered the questions and I don't know what I did, but I got offered the job on the spot after being told that they had interviewed several candidates already. She offered me this, the job on the spot. And I'll never forget, she says to me, uh, my, my boss and mentor at the time, she says to me, kids your age do not get the opportunity that you're about to get 
don't fuck this up word for word i i apologize for swearing but that was her words word for word yeah. and i and i'm like Good. okay that's not intimidating or anything i haven't even yeah. started yet she's already put the screws to me yeah. and you know I, i'm i'm excited and she's like look your job is to sit here and listen and absorb like a sponge and say nothing you ask questions at the right time but your job is to just sit here and listen and learn okay sure mm -hmm. sounds good um i walk in the following monday and i meet the couple of the people on the team it was a very small operation there was like five traders and a back office person and that was it and like a, a salesperson and i met the salesperson who's still a friend of mine today and he's like david i gotta go ahead and warn you now this is a 2000 the day the market crashed in march of 2000 was my first day oh, and wow, okay. um obviously looking back i didn't know the market was crashing that day but now now here we are 20 plus years later so you mean there's no there's no neon lights telling anybody well, that the market's crashing because we uh, knew I, that if we some, knew someone that on, we, someone on twitter told me otherwise if we knew <laughs> that we'd be on our way to fiji in our respective g5 jets since we're fortune tellers that, that'll be um, the next podcast yes yeah exactly <laughs> so I remember the salesperson introducing himself. He's like, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but don't get comfortable, man. REITs, who cares about real estate? This is boring. These are going to be gone in five years, so keep your resume fresh. Literally, this is what he's telling me as I haven't even sat down at my desk to start my job, and he's already telling me to keep my resume warm. That's the, and, Matthew, that's the Matthew McConaughey character from uh, Wolf of Wall Street, isn't it? Pretty much. It, it, was, <laughs> it was a little intimidating because, yeah. again, what do I know? And I want to knock the socks off. And so, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm listening. And, you know, my boss says to me, you're not going to be picking up the phones or doing anything for at least nine months, maybe closer to a year. Well, I was on the phone within six months mm -hmm. because I got it. And looking back on it now, what I saw in her is what I should have seen with any advisor as I was coming out of it is that. At 22, 23, when you're graduating, you're a, basically a blank piece of clay. Whoever is going to hire you is able to mold you into whatever type of professional they want you to be. So if you're going into engineering and you're a 22-year-old engineering graduate, that first job, your, your boss, your mentor, your leaders are going to mold you into that piece of clay to be the best engineer or whatever it is that you're going to do. So again, looking back on it, I could have gone to work for another advisor who would have seen me as a raw piece of clay and could have molded me to be the best advisor that possibly could be out there. Um, so as I'm sitting there learning about the REIT industry, real estate, what I got to witness was basically this industry grow up from an infant to an adult. Frankly, again, it took over the course of you know 15 years, but it was overnight. We're mm -hmm. talking 100 companies coming public, many new funds coming to market, new investor types, new sectors, you know, and, and realizing very quickly, and this is something important for all of, you know, your listeners here, you can't go pretty much leave your house and go from point A to point B without interacting with the REIT owned property of some form. A REIT is basically, okay, a REIT is a tax structure. It's just simply a tax structure. Yeah. But the, the, the way it works is there's many different types of sectors of REITs offices, apartments, malls, self-storage, data centers, towers, industrial properties, the healthcare properties, the list goes on and on. Um, I always like to start out with a conversation with somebody like this. I'll, you know, Let me pose you a question. Paul, have you gone to Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts and had a cup of coffee recently? Or for you up there, it'd be Tim Hortons. Have you had Tim Hortons wow, recently? You're, you're getting real local there. Yeah, no, I, I, I do go to Starbucks because my daughter loves it there. And uh, that's her... Uh, favorite place so yes yeah, starbucks is definitely a regular stop yeah have you gone to a walgreens a cvs or whatever your respective drug store is uh well yeah I, I those are u.s stores but yes i've been to those uh when i've uh, when we've gone to the states of course yeah all right and let me give you a, this is a real tough one so you'll have to think about this one <laughs> have you gone to the grocery center grocery store recently and bought groceries mm, yeah <laughs> absolutely and all in all three of those examples, you've most likely interacted with a REIT owned property. Yep. And so when you realize that Starbucks doesn't own that store that you went to, it's owned by a, a most likely a REIT or some kind of real estate entity that pays rent to the landlord. Starbucks pays rent to that landlord. Well, that rental income goes into investors' pockets as the form of dividends. 
So we're focused on dividend income. Yeah. And as I was sitting there learning at Green Street, learning about all of these different REITs and how they operate, and we're going through economic cycles and 9-11 and housing crashes and everything, like it's amazing to see what happened. So I was able to grow up in the REIT industry, learning from some of the best minds on the street that it propelled me from the rest of my career. I left Green Street in... Um, the end of 2011, just before 2012. And, you know, that's almost, gosh, 10, 12 years ago now. And it yet still feels like yesterday. Like, you know, just because I've been able to carry everything that I've learned, all the contacts and networking and everything that I've done that's pushed me for the next, you know, 12 plus years through my career to where I sit today. Well, you know what? Again, this is, uh, Dave, this is one of the things that I love about talking to people, again, from, um, Similar and even different, uh, um, uh, similar and, and even different uh, levels of expertise. Because I've had everybody from uh, Amazon top top selling Amazon authors to comedians uh, to small business owners around my city. Just because I, I like having to open my own mind about things and learn about things. So I'm definitely doing that with you, but you also touched on something that was so important for people who were listening. And I know from reading the stats that podcast listeners are in that 20 to like 35 range. That's where the majority of them are. And again, all of you guys listening, whatever your age is, obviously I, I love that you're listening, but especially those of you who are young and, and it means a lot to me because my kids are, um, at the age where a lot of the conscious thinking of life starts for my son, he's 14, my daughter is almost 18. So a lot of the things that you're going to learn in life are starting to kick in now. So being young and you, and you, and you brought this up. So I'm going to sort of dig into this. When you're in your twenties, you're even, you're second guessing your second guesses. You don't know enough to be able to necessarily, you know, stand up a lot of times and say, um, you know, I'm not doing, you know, I, I don't think this is the right idea. I don't think this is right for me. So the fact that you did what you did and you said, you, you know, you got the hell out of there. Um, I had a similar experience in my late teens where I had a boss uh, tell me that I, I was in Florida on vacation for a week. He, I, I call back just to see what my shifts are next week. He goes, I, I never gave you the okay to, 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 to go to, to, to go away this week. You're supposed to be, you you have a shift tomorrow. And I said, no, I don't. I, I got the week off. Well, if you don't come back tomorrow, you're done. And I, I had a similar conversation to you. I said, ah, fuck you. And then I hung up because I, I was at the point where I was already away. I needed to be away. And I knew that at that age, something told me, if I don't do this now, I know I'm going to regret it. And I might have still been at that job. And I was in the fitness business for a decade. I loved it. I loved being with all those people. I loved helping people, you know, reach their goals, quit smoking, you know, all the things that, again, the, the doctors tell them, you know, you got to go join a gym now. And then after that, I took over. Uh, I love that stuff. So learning those things, like you mentioned, Dave, I think that's really one of the things that sort of um, goes over, not just the fact that whether or not the person listening is a fan or possible future an investor in a REIT that, you know, that that's, that's a very small pigeonhole situation. We might not have that, but a lot of those life lessons that you learned that I learned, um, I think those are, you know, that's kind of what makes storytelling. So, um, so powerful. So I think I, I, I appreciate you, know, you sharing that. Paul, to build on what you're saying there, and I appreciate that. I, I mean, one lesson that everybody needs to understand to take away here, you know, that's that expression. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. What you know is important, but who you know is even more important. And the reason why I use that example, have you ever, ever heard of that game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? You know oh, what yeah. that game is? Oh, yeah, we know it here, too. It, it, it translates up here just fine. <laughs> right. So I, I use that example because like that's for me in the world of real estate or the REIT industry. If you wanted to talk to whoever is on the top of the mountain, you know, within six of my touches of my network, I could get you talking to that person. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's very important, especially again, when you're young, you know, you get laid off when you're 22, 23. It's OK. You still got 30, 40 years of job work ahead of you. You've got a time to figure it out. And not everybody knows at 22 what they want to do when they graduate. You know, people sometimes take a little bit of time to find that right environment, that right space where it's like, oh, my gosh, I love this. I want to do this. You know, you know, the, the best example is, you know, work isn't work when you feel like you're working. 
right? So, you know, if you do what you love, I mean, it's again, like I love to talk to people about this, this little tiny industry. I love educating. I love to give back to the next generation. It was, you know, people help uh, forge the foundation for me to get to where I am today. And it's, it's, you know, it's never too early to start giving back to that high school student, that college graduate, you know, that's coming up the ranks that needs that help just as well. Not everybody gets handed a massive book of business on day one. Not everybody is set when they turn 23 and they've got everything all laid out for them. Um, but if there's people that are mentors and, you know, industry professionals and, you know, especially these companies themselves, the guys that I deal with, you know, the, the industry themselves, they want to educate. They want to help the next generation. It's all about trying to, you know, draw people into the industry and get them excited about Wall Street, about whatever it is. You know, there's there's a good network that's out there. I mean, look at the rise of like Discord, the, you know, the social media platform Discord. Twitter with all of their subgroups, LinkedIn, you know, there are groups that are out there to help you get to where you want to go. Yeah, yeah, no. And again, I, I, I learned and I've learned more about technology from my kids than I've ever been able to learn. And, and I was one of those kids in the 80s. And again, you'll, you'll, you'll understand this part we talked about, you were talking about a Radio Shack uh, <laughs> ads and, 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 and all the things that if you, if you, if you had three grand, uh, or more, you, you'd be able to buy all the things that are now on our iPhones. Um, but the fact is, back in the 80s, I was learning how to use, um, speaking of Texas, my Texas Instruments, uh, mm -hmm. TI-99. That was the, the, like, the first computer I, uh, I learned to code on. So I started learning all that stuff early. But once Did you have one of those TI graphing calculators when you were in school? Do you remember yeah. those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had those, yeah. And we'll think about it again how you now you could just use that on your iPhone. Like, oh, how yeah, yeah. yeah, they're not. And, and my kids, I think they're, there's there's certain points where they're not allowed to bring their phones into certain tests because, again, it's just too much power. By so, the way, they still they still sell those calculators. I saw in the store not too long ago. They still have the TI graphing calculators. Oh, yeah. And I was joking with my, my wife. I want to get one. She's like, why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> She's like, first of all, what do you do that you would need to use one? Which the answer is, I don't do anything with it. Yeah. But it's also like nostalgia. You know what well, I mean? Like I remember you, you, playing you, you games. Nailed it. That's that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate description of why I've gone to see probably uh, not just thousands of concerts over the last. I guess since the nineties, um, like just, you know, hundreds, I, I think probably thousands, a few I've forgotten. Did you ever um, see fish? Uh, I haven't seen fish, but we're going to talk about fish and we're going to talk about, of course, fish related music. Um, but uh, <laughs> understanding that nostalgia, the, the power of that is the reason why one of my favorite places to go now is uh, there's a bar in Toronto here called the Linsmore Tavern. And it is literally the upper, upper level of, the best cover bands and the last guy mm -hmm. that i just saw for a cover band he was a stevie ray vaughn you'll understand oh, wow. this as a texas guy and i'm a guitar player so when when i was watching this guy play literally stevie ray vaughn was standing in front of me wow um, the first the first first guy i've ever seen do a cover band and he was incredible and apparently he also does a zz top cover band as well on the side wow. and the guy's just he just Blow, blew my mind but so let's let's talk about let's let's maybe sort of uh jump into something a little lighter that again other people might want to listen to is yeah you obviously are a big fan uh of fish so tell me a little bit about how that started because i love That's hearing musical <laughs> journeys just as much i'll be seeing my 200th show here actually in oh, a couple yeah, of weeks you're one of those you got the uh you got you got the multiple ticket stubs and the t-shirts and all that absolutely awesome. yeah, pretty awesome. much my entire closet um it's funny um so i mentioned going to my summer camp when i was a kid and um, one of my good friends you know i met in 1987 growing up for many years his brother um was a camper there in my first couple of years much older than us and he wound up graduating and he uh, launched what I what turned out many years later what wound up being Fish's charity arm, their charitable arm okay. uh, called called Waterwheel, but it used to be Greenpeace. He worked for Greenpeace. Everybody recalls Greenpeace, okay. and so Greenpeace would go around with the band from show to show and set up a table and collect donations. And so, you know, the, for them, the band started in 1984. They started growing in popularity like in the early 90s. 90, 91, 92 is when they started playing the club scene. 94 is when they moved to amphitheaters. 95, 96 was arenas. You know, they they grew up like a, a band. Well, I remember being a camp in 1991. 
Okay. It was like 92, 93. I was at yeah. camp and my friend brought up a CD of the band. I never heard of them. And he played this. And for all those that want to know, it was the first, the first CD they'd ever put out. It's called Junta, J U N T A. Yeah. And the first song on the album is called Feet. And we played Fee, I'm not exaggerating, you know, five times a day. Uh, we would sometimes listen to some of the other songs on the album, but we we wore out the, the CD or the tape or whatever it was back then. And, um, you know, I wasn't, it was cool. I didn't know anything about them back then because I was a kid. So fast forward a couple of years later, um, my friend and I go down to the University of Texas. Back in the day, fraternities used to do like a... Uh, um, a pre-rush event for you know like for texas for this for the um graduating students that live in uh houston dallas whatever they would do events at, at campus to encourage you to come down sort of rushing the fraternity sororities and so my friend and i went down for one of these weekends we were in one of the fraternity houses hanging out with a guy and he's like oh you, you gotta listen to this great new album i got check out this band and it wound up being fish and the album was rift and the song that he played was called way and it's a crazy song but like my friend and i were like absolutely hooked on this one song yeah. that you know like we're like okay we gotta check this out and we listened to it and uh i jogged my memory about fee and junta and at camp and so when i got to college you, you know a semester later and a couple of the guys in my fraternity like were big fans and like every single day they're playing you know playing tapes and you know we're, we're talking about it they're going to see them that like it was almost like just kind of forced on me when i when i joined because of my friendship my friend group and then from that point on i was hooked i saw my first show in april of 1996 um and the funny thing is living in dallas they like never came to dallas when they would come and be when i was up at camp in summer camp I would always miss them. And my friends would be like, when are you going to choose this year? You're going to choose to see fish in Dallas? You're going to go to camp. And camp yeah. always won out. Yeah. And so I would always have to travel to go see them. I mean, I probably, I couldn't even tell you, I don't even want to think about how much I've spent on them. But, you know, it's opened me up to a lot of other music because they're, you know, they, they play covers, their own songs, jazz, rock, country, every single music genre that's out there. I mean, they're all PhD musicians that, you know, every single show is different, like the Grateful Dead or some of those things. No two shows are alike. You never know what you're going to get. You can go see uh, if they do a, a 13 show run at Madison Square Garden, you are not going to see the same show or the same song in 13 shows. Like, well, that's I, the I, cool I, thing about them. And, and again, just because, again, I, I, I love talking about this, so I will gladly interject my story. I think my version of Fish is Rush. Oh, yeah, of is, course. Which is of a course. Similar, um, <laughs> similar type of educated very specific music uh, of course again 2112 was recorded like 10 minutes from my house um so i i think there may have been some of those musical vibes that entered my body at some point in the 70s uh, but anyways anybody who can discuss music the way you do and this, this is what i was going to get get to dave the happiest people i know and this is this is just over the years the happiest people i know that i've you know again i'm in my late 40s you're in your 40s um, the happiest people I know in their 40s, 50s and 60s are the ones that spent at least one or two decades of their lives um, wasting their youth, as in going to concerts like, you know, if you had 20 bucks and there was a concert for 15, that that was me. That if I, you know, if I, if I got my hold my hand on 20 bucks, I was like, OK, I'm going to see Steve Miller at Canada's Wonderland because, um, you know, this who knows if I'll get a chance again. And I still got all those ticket stubs. And those are the people that I know now, like all of us that are older that have that very much no regret look to life. Like we can look back and say, man, like I don't, I didn't save any, for me, it was the nineties. Like I didn't save $1 in the nineties. I, I, you, you would not have looked at me at some, someone as an example of, of any financial uh, advice whatsoever. And I'm still not a financial guy, but, um, 
later on, I was like, okay, I, I spent all my money on concerts for uh, almost a decade. Now I can start saving money for other things. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was really easy because I had no regrets. I didn't, I, I, I'm not, I'm not in my forties wishing I did all this stuff because I had the fast car for a while. I got that out of my system when all to, went, went to all the shows, for example, the rush shows, uh, uh, I started in 90, went to another one in 93, another one, 95, uh, ACDC, Guns N' Roses, like basically everyone that I ever wanted to see. Uh, and the, the, the one story that I'll bring up, and I actually posted this on Twitter, I'll, I might repost it and I'll tag you in it. Um, there's this video of this guy that uh, does this really funny video of, of him, uh, just like a pretend video of him listening to Rage Against the Machine for the first yeah, of time in 93. Yeah. It's hilarious because he'll just, he, he's, he's sitting there just talking about how, um, man, I've never heard anything like this before. These guys are really angry, <laughs> but I, I also feel angry, but I'm also thinking. <laughs> so, so, so he's like analyzing the way we were feeling like, like you said, listening to fish for the first time for me, it was, you know, some guy at school bringing the, bringing the, you know, bringing the big radio box with the tape player and throwing in um, whatever was really interesting at the time, uh, stuff like um, uh, I, I'd say stuff like uh, pro probably um, rage against the machine, chili peppers, stuff like that, that you just started listening to like, what the hell is this stuff? Right. And, and, and again, not being as big of a fan of fish, but uh, uh, of course, not not knowing the music as well, but knowing what music can do to us. Uh, I can totally see why you're still going to your shows. And uh, for well, me, I'm still taking my kids to see uh, last show that we saw um, that came to our town. That was something I really wanted the kids to see was Dennis DeYoung, the, the lead singer of Styx. Okay. Uh, because that that music for me was like that was that seventies rock. My wife says the same thing. Like if she hears seventies rock, she's like, "That's that's totally you." Uh, so chances are you've got all those same nostalgia vitamins going through your system. You know, as, so as yeah. what's cool? What's cool for me is that when I was when I was again you know freshman sophomore, you know I was able to turn my father on to because my father was a big jazz fan. Uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, like love oh, yeah. jazz. Okay. And so I played him a couple of songs and like it was the same thing. He got it instantly. And now my father has seen like 60 shows as well. Oh. You know, it's a great father son bonding event for us to, you know, he's going to the shows with me here in a couple of weeks together. Um, and so, you know, it's one of those things. It's a great way to spend, you know, time with your folks, father, son, you know, again, like you taking your kids to concerts as well. Yeah. These are things that they're going to remember the rest of their lives. You know, I remember going to see, you know, he, he tells me like, do you remember, like, it was funny because like we were, I, we were together at a wedding, uh, um, a wedding just a couple of weeks ago. We were in the car driving a, a song comes on the radio is like, do you remember where we heard this song? And I mean, yeah. I, I'm like, that i've heard the song 75 shows what are you talking yeah. about yeah, yeah but yeah. like I, I knew what show he was talking about it's like columbus 1999 the rainstorm do you remember hearing that show i'm like of course i knew you were going to say that show dad of course yeah, yeah. um but like it's it's again it's something that he and i've been able to enjoy together and so Amazing. i'm sure that plays into it too but yeah you know it's again it's and it's um it's 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 different i mean again it's 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 a different vibe you're in the cool thing is like you go talk to the security guards at a fish concert and you're like you know what's it like is this cool what do you guys think about this and they're like this is the hardest show we have to prepare for of anybody on the calendar i'm like why is that they go because you get such a, a demographic cross section of, of society old versus young rich and poor white black yellow red every single color skin under the mm -hmm. sun like mm -hmm. it's it's it you, you can't you know it's a country it's a country artist coming in okay we know it's going to be a bunch of men wearing jeans and cowboy hats yeah you know oh it's it's a rap concert okay we know what that type of audience could potentially be oh it's heavy metal we know what the headbangers are like fish we don't know what the hell is coming to town yeah. so yeah. you know it's a really cool just, again it's like it's like people watching you know you just kind of watch the show so that's amazing, um, that's amazing. yeah it's great uh, Dave, again, I know that uh, this is one of those to be continued podcasts because it sounds like we again, uh, it's like that scene from Step Brothers where, where the guys say, <laughs> hey, did we just become best friends? Uh, for me, these conversations are where it happens, because, again, I could have tweeted back and forth with you for another two months and probably not gotten as far as a, you know, whatever this was, 20 minute, you know, 
podcast <laughs> audio conversation to me. Um, this is again, voices and the emotions and the fact that we can share a story like this and, and again, not get exhausted, uh, you know, typing all the stuff out. I think that's uh, all part of it. So I wanted to say thank you for, again, your, your, your time today. Thank you for the, uh, the very interesting education on REITs. Uh, of course, where you came up from. Uh, so I guess the most important thing of all is uh, what would be the best way for people who are, again, hoping to continue the conversation with you? Uh, what's the best way for them to reach out and uh, connect with you? Thanks so much. First of all, Paul, this was awesome. This is a lot of fun. Can't, I hope we could do this again because, like you said, we could sit here and talk for hours. Oh, I we really will. appreciate. We're going to do this again. I, I I can say this is a. I mean, we could do the three hour podcast and chop it up, <laughs> and and we don't have to even talk again for the rest of the year. But I'm looking forward to doing another one, uh, and and having maybe a bit more, uh, you know, detailed conversation. Thank so you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank for you. Your time. You know, so if you want to reach me, I, I I'm followed on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Daily Reit R E I T Beat all one word uh my email is uh d auerbach a u e r b a c h at armada a r m a d a e t f s armada etfs dot com happy to reach out educate talk anything reach real estate etfs and if you want to talk about fish i'm always down for that conversation as well all right man that's uh that's amazing uh once again thanks for your time today dave i appreciate you joining me paul you're awesome thank you so much okay Take care.